there in your Bibles. <clears throat> Last week we spoke on hope and and we got down to you know the the one true hope we have is the hope of glory Christ in us. And we got down to I thought several good points you can go back and listen to it, but you get the idea. It was hope that Jesus would be in us and that things would be as he said. Um, this week we're going to get into Ezra and we're going to discuss the temple. Now, uh, when we get into the Old Testament stuff, um, first off, this book, the Bible, it is the most interesting, fascinating book that's ever been read by human eyes, right? On top of the fact that it is just this crazy history this crazy story told, this poet, poetic takes on what's going on around them. It's, it's just, it is so layered, nuanced literature, but it is also a, a graced by, the, by God himself to empower us to be something, to see something, to know something. And, and we glean from all of it, and, and it's, it's, it's really, really powerful. And, and there's a, this theme of the temple in the Bible, in the Old Testament, and, and we have what we call in, in history, we have New t First Temple Era and Second Temple Era. And, and Ezra is when we start Second Temple Era, and that runs until Jesus comes. And then shortly after Jesus, there's the, the destruction of Jerusalem, and they destroy the Second Temple. And we've never had a temple since then. Um, this is the beginning of Second Temple Era. And the reason why, I, one of the benefits of going back and looking at this stuff is while discussing and learning history and details and facts, I absolutely love it myself and would uh, encourage you all to dig deeper into all that stuff, including timelines as we discussed before. It's just fascinating. Like you, if, if you can get um, hooked on the Word of God deep enough, you won't have need for any other form of entertainment. Yeah. Just to, not to say that we don't all prefer the cheap entertainment of sitting down and doing nothing. This one requires you to do some work, but it is all there. But one of the things that we um, we talked about as a group some time ago, and there's a lot of new people here uh, since then, so I just wanted to rehash that. I, um, I kind of presented an idea early on and I said, you know, if I can just throw stuff out there to mature Christians, these ideas, these concepts, these ways to read the Old Testament, these, you know, different things. If I can just throw them out there without, and not spend the next hour or two debating the legitimacy of those views or ideas, if I can just present them as possible ideas for you to go do the work with, for you to go spend time with the Lord and let him minister to your heart and open your eyes, that we can cover a lot more ground. Meaning, I can, I can present certain ideas. Like a couple weeks ago, I presented the idea that um, Elijah and Elijah were early, uh, like prophetic, um, early witnesses on earth of what it would look like to have the Holy Spirit. They also kind of, in the way they interact with the people in their storylines, they, they're, they're a symbolic representation of the Holy Spirit interacting with us. Now, I didn't spend a lot of time driving that point home, although we could. I just said it. Some of you accepted it. And then we went on to look at the scripture. And that's the fastest way to cover a lot of ground. Amen? Yeah. When we get to the temple topics, very, very important. We're going to talk about why that's very important in just a second. But um, I'm going to propose just a quick idea here that the reason why there's so much language around the temples, these literal temples in the Old Testament, and the reason why it's so important to go back and study them is it's symbolic of what's supposed to be in you now. Right? So... Um, the whole, all the prophecies, even during this time, they were foretelling that a day would come when Jesus would build a new temple, and there'd be a new altar, and there'd be no longer tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments. There'd be the commandments of God would be written in the tablets of flesh, our hearts. And Ezekiel saw this vision of this new temple. He wasn't the only one, but of this new temple and this new altar. And out of this new altar, there flowed this river that came out of it and turned into this river of life and it's beautiful there's trees with um, fruits for uh, food and leaves to heal the nations and the fish of 
Let me see, we talk about it a lot. It's my favorite little thing to picture, yeah? It, it, this new temple, new river, and Jesus comes and says, follow me, and out of your heart will flow this river of living water. See, it was all pointing to this new temple that was coming in this new covenant. So why did they have actual temples in the Old Testament when God was trying to get them to this thing, right? This, this where we are the living, walking temples of God. Well, the best I can make sense of that in understanding the word and understanding God's nature that I've learned over the years, um, take this, is it just, this is just my take on it. I believe that God gave them commandment to build the temples he gave them instructions and details and, he, and the winds and the hows and he provided resources because God's intention for us was to dwell in all of our hearts as a new temple. However, they weren't at a place where they were ready for that. I can back that statement up in great detail if you need to, but I don't want to today. He wanted to be with his people. He wanted, he never wanted the Ten Commandments written on stone. He wanted to write it on their flesh on Mount Sinai, but they chose to look away make the gold calf revert back and then it's like, ah, they missed their chance. There's just, the whole Bible is the story of missing the chance to partner with God's perfect plan. Yeah. So he desperately wants a temple in your heart where you can worship God, but they couldn't get that so he gave them instructions to build an actual temple yeah. where he could dwell and they'd at least have that. Okay? We're not here to talk about this next statement. This is just a freebie to put in your pocket for later, but don't ever let anybody convince you that everything that's going on in your life, around you, around people, with you, that it's God's perfect plan every single time. It makes him weird and unpredictable to think that every crazy, tragic, chaotic thing is a perfect plan. Yeah. If everything was a perfect plan, the Bible story wouldn't have changed through the covenants. See, they can only do what they can do, and we can only do what we can do. And, and we are all evolving as a human race towards this bigger picture of what God intended in the garden so obviously and clearly. This, this garden scenario where he created us to rule and reign and till the soil without sweat of our brow and children come forth in zero pain and, and just all this stuff. We command, speak to animals. We grow the garden with this powerful word of God in our heart. And then we don't see another thing that looks anywhere close to that until we get the revel at the end of the book of Revelation where John's seen far into the future of what humanity ends up at. It's this full circle right back to the beginning. We're somewhere in this journey. Right? So I say that to say every little thing that's going on that doesn't seem like great and sure you can say well God will work it out. He will. You can say God works in mysterious ways. If you don't know him it's all mysterious. I will say this. It makes him weird to think it's the perfect plan, though. Yeah? So when it doesn't feel like a perfect plan, pray. It's weird to believe that everything is God's perfect plan and pray against it. We have to break that notion that we're yeah. living in the, in the perfect time of humanity where everything's God's perfect plan. Because then where is your zeal for praying against it? Yeah. For praying a new future, a new life, a new destiny. Amen? Amen. Amen. Not what we were talking about today. Sorry. <laughs> By the time we get to this new temple, the second temple era, um, on my timeline, I know that's a little hard to read, maybe from where you're sitting, but we're right around 519 is where the first temple degree, uh, or 36 is where they decide to start building it, 19 is when they finish it. We're right there on that timeline. On a much bigger snapshot of that timeline, which is going to be even more impossible to read, this is the concept that we talk about whenever we talk about eschatology. Eschatology is our study or our belief of, of the, the how things end. How things end should be understood as to how things have been going. And one of the things that I said, and I, and I did get this concept from my, uh, another well, uh, philosopher, but he said, and I say, the, most, the biggest mistake you'll ever make is taking a single snapshot of your worst day ever and say, humanity's going down. Or to turn on the news of any country in the world at any time and see what's going on in the news, then you'll say it's getting worse every day. Then you see the platform for eschatology that says it's all going to go to hell in a handbasket and Jesus is going to come back and kill everybody. That's the thinking that got us to start thinking the opposite of what the word says. And the more proper way to look at God's intention on earth is in 500 year increments, roughly. 
500 year snapshots. If you take 500 year snapshots, then you can say, wow, not the worst day ever. We're getting better and better and better. Things are getting better and better and better. And now, easy, now we're, in, we're on seven continents as Christians. Some of us are better than others, certain continents, yeah. We're in a time where um, the whole world was told to stop working recently. The whole world was told to come to a grinding halt. And I don't know about the rest of the world, but I know that in this country, I don't even think people starved. I don't even think people walk. Most people got more stuff. What a crazy time we live in. People used to die when they didn't work. You know what I mean? I'm not promoting not working. I'm just promoting that things are getting better. No one's lost their head in this country for their faith in a long, long time. Things are getting better. 500-year snapshots, yeah? 500-year snapshots. Okay? Today we're talking about that third little circle that says second temple. That's that 500-year snapshot that's right around, what did I just say? 536. Back up 500, excuse me, 492 years to be exact, you get first temple being built. Yeah? If you go 490 years after second temple, we get new temple being built. Yeah? Yeah. Now that seems weird. I'm not going to drive this 500-year thing home too quickly, too, too much here, but 500-year increments, you see God's intention manifesting in greater and greater ways. Back up 500 years from first temple, guess what we have? The covenant of the ark. Ark of the covenant being made, laid in gold, filled with the, uh, the things of God, the, the, the commandments, the reeds, and all that stuff, and then they take it with them everywhere they go. This moving ark of the covenant is given to them it's uh, instituted kind of by Moses, right? This considered to be one of the great men of God that lived on earth as pioneers for our faith. This Ark of the Covenant, he had a tabernacle that they would take with them everywhere they went and they would uh, worship God and he would be in this tabernacle. Oh, that's that's uh, old language for tent. It's tent. Yeah? And then we go forward and then we get from Moses' tabernacle, we get the tabernacle of David. King David, the one who wrote all the Psalms and, con and just... This great man of God, this great leader, this poetic warrior, he has the tabernacle of David, this tent that goes around where God is with them. And he wants to build a temple, but God says no. And some people speculate and believe that it's just, it, it, you know, it's because of his missteps that he wasn't allowed to. And only his son Solomon will be allowed to. However, his son Solomon was far more flawed than he ever was. But when we get forward to the time of Jesus, they're believing for the resurrection of the tabernacle of David. In a time where the temple still existed, they're still believing for the resurrection of the tent that David used to worship in. And then we flash forward into this new covenant era, and we get the new covenant writers, the New Testament writers, and they're referring to us as this tabernacle or this tent. We are the moving tabernacle of God, the new temple of the new era. Yes? Yeah. Okay. Everybody got that? Yeah. Guess what? If you do 500 year increments, guess where we're at? 500 year increments. Christ came 500 years later, 1,000, 1,500. We're going to skip those. I can do them though. 2,000. We're in 2,000. That's a 500 year increment. And for all of you who have uh, been with us for long, I've been proclaiming and proclaiming that God's doing a new big thing. Although, I do, and then I always say, but it's not new. It's the same old thing, but just in a pure, intense, righteous form. This new thing of we're trying to uh, we're trying to build our ideas of church, our model for church around what we read in the New Covenant Church, where they. They just were in awe of God and the Holy Spirit. They loved one another. And, they, and it says that they went from house to house, breaking bread and living with gladness and simplicity of heart. And, and just and gladness is interpreted better as wild joy. And simple is not like simple-minded. It's, it's singular focus. Yeah. They had a wild joy and a single focus yeah. going from house to house, eating together, praying together, discussing mm -hmm. the apostles' doctrine. This is all from Acts 2 if you want to go back and read it. This wild simplicity where they just lived and grew together. And they grew by the thousands. And then they, they had deacons coming up to serve because servitude is the way of the Lord. And then they 
and to just it was just this wonderful wonderful time on earth and i believe that we at, at some point humanity lost the focus of the simplicity of God's plan on earth, and we made it more complicated in the church world. And I believe that we're in that increment where God's restoring the original balance of what church family was supposed to look like. Yeah? yeah? yeah. You see, in the 500-year increment thing, remember, it's all about snapshots and not, not every day of everybody's life. See, right before the second temple snapshot of God's restoring the temple on earth, they were in yeah. captivity in Babylon. They were enslaved, and there was no temple because they had destroyed it. Not them. The people who captured, who captive, took them captive. <laughs> captured <laughs> would be the be best word. Captured made their attention. They had destroyed the temple. So right before this time, you could look and say, not going good at all now, guys. Yeah. Not going good at all. We got the temple. We're enslaved. But the one thing that is proven time and time again is that God wants to liberate us yeah. because he's constantly saving his people from bondage, a bondage that they almost always got themselves into through their decision making, yeah. just like we often do. Just like if I was to make a claim that many forms of religion and church sectors in the, in the past were a form of bondage, if you will, a form of legalism and bondage, and there was actually various forms of legalism and bondage in the church world that we got ourselves into, and I believe that this is a snapshot, 500-year increment, where God's trying to rectify that problem and get us back to this original intention. Amen? Amen. That's very fun. Now, what's the most important thing about the, the temple of this new era? It's that it's in our hearts. It's that we carry it. It's that we get to steward it. It's that we get to have um, the altar of atonement in our heart and that we get to know Jesus, the Lamb of God, who shed his blood for the atonement of that on that altar. Amen? It's a beautiful uh, picture. It's a beautiful uh, idea that we live in. So it's a lot of hope. Last week I talked about the hope of glory. I can also talk about the hope of eschatology. 500 year increments, you get way more excited than watching the news, right? Yeah. 500 year increments says we're going somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, if you think God's delayed, you haven't read the Bible close enough. Because we're currently 6,000 years into a plan. It's we diverted from the original plan. But God is redeeming our diversion and He's getting us back to the original plan. We're 6,000 years. He promised um, Abraham. That to all, if anyone who would follow his word, that he would bless them and their children for a thousand generations. Now, I've done that math for you before. Easy peasy. If you just do basic numbers, that's a minimum of a hundred thousand years. And then if you add an S at the end for uh, thousands of generations, which it actually says, well, now it's hundreds times S, thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. We're 6,000 years into it already looking as good as it does. Tell me he's slow. Yeah. I know Revelation 21, 22, when you read it, I know it seems far-fetched to think that the earth could look so good under the glory of God. But in 6,000 years, we've made it this far. In 6,000 years, in 2,000 years, we had one guy who could walk around healing everybody. After he died, we had 12 guys. And then we had, um, you know, a couple hundred more after that for a long, long time. Now we got Brandon at the soccer game praying for somebody's pain to go away and it goes away. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't want to take away from Brandon, but I, could, I got busloads of Brandon's stories to tell now, of people I know who just believe that Jesus, that this is what we're doing. It's the glory of God covering the earth. Mm -hmm. In 2,000 years, we've made it this far, and we have, according to the promise to Abraham, a minimum of 94,000 more years to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah? <laughs> I didn't plan on doing eschatology today, but just in case you were wondering, he flooded the earth one time because there was only one righteous man, Noah. He, he burnt Sodom and Gomorrah because there wasn't at least three decent people in there to save, and arguably Lot, the one he did save, wasn't a decent person. History tells us he absolutely was not. But Abraham, a decent man, had made a promise to protect him. Yeah. See, God doesn't seem to make a habit of destroying good people. 
Mm. Whenever there's hope on earth, he will not start over. Mm. Yeah. The few times it started over, it's because there was no hope on earth. Mm. Yeah? yeah? There's enough people in this room alone to deter a start over. <laughs> if you believe that this word of God is immutable and teaches us the nature of God. Mm -hmm. And that he wasn't meant to be working in mysterious ways, you know. That he said, Jesus said, I no longer call you servants because servants don't know what's going on. They stay out of the house and serve. I call you friends because I tell you all things that I'm doing and I tell you to come into the house. Yeah? Yeah? So let's give up on the mysterious ways and let's dig a little deeper into what this all means. Amen? Amen. So when we get to the temple eras, mind you, this is the inferior temple, but there's a lot of details on how, who, what, when, and where it got built. And these are very important as symbolic to you building your temple. You stewarding your temple. How many of you have maybe, um, you, you maybe have heard this concept of you're the new temple, and maybe you've believed it to some degree. How many of you have already experienced that um, you don't always feel like the walking temple of God? <laughs> yeah? Mm -hmm. There's a recipe to life that we find in this word of God that helps us get straight to the point. Amen? Yeah, so we're going to run through not the whole book of Ezra, but just certain aspects of of the steps they took when it was time to rebuild the temple. This is very important. Starting in um, chapter 3, verses 2 through 3. The very first thing they do when it's time to build the temple, remind you, think about your heart. It says, They arose and built the altar, the altar of God of Israel, to offer burnt offerings on it, as it was written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Though fear had come upon them because the people of those countries, they set the altar on its bases and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord. Both morning, evening, burnt offerings. The very first thing they do is start giving to God. The very first thing they do is start burning the sacrifices before the Lord for the sweet aroma to come up to the heavens, it says. The very first thing they do. Now, in our most human thinking, we got to build the temple, we got to do all this, we got to get the decorations, and then when the proper time comes, we start doing the offering. Yeah? They start with the offering. That's a very important thing. It also, this is a weird, if you read Ezra, it's a short book, but it's a weird little book. It's got weird details. The very first thing they knew to do was build the altar to do the offerings. But they were afraid of the people around them, the, the enemy nations that had closed in on them because they've been gone and they're in, in captivity and no one's, they haven't been this great strong nation defending itself. So they're afraid of the people around them. I would encourage you in this. As you're building, stewarding, protecting, furthering the temple in your heart, be aware that it's going to require some sacrifices to the Lord. Don't let your fear of what's around you stop you from being what God made you to be. Amen? Amen. Chapter 3, verse 8. And they began work and appointed the Levites from 20 years old and above to oversee the work of the house of the Lord. Levites were the tribe of Israel who were um, dedicated to serving God. They're all supposed to be a nation under God. But they're divided into tribes. The Levites were the ones who were dedicated, devoted to serving the Lord, serving the temple, serving the temple, serving the sacrifice. They were dedicated. They weren't even supposed to own land because they weren't supposed to be distracted from their calling. They all, uh, most of them were tradesmen, and they cycled in and out the temple duties. They made scripture temple duties. They made prayer. They made it their main focus in life. They made their... Um, their trades and their, you know, whatever, survival, second. But the rest of Israel was supposed to take care of them because they needed them to do what they did. Yeah? It's very important when you go to build the temple. First, the altar comes. The sacrifices. No fear of what's around you. Second, let the ones that God put on this earth help you oversee the work. Yeah? We're going to come back to that in a second. Chapter 3, verse 10. 
When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, and praised the Lord according to the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsibly, praising and giving thanks to the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord as you're building your temple. If you're waiting for a finished product, you might not ever get there. Because the further you go in the Lord, the further you go in this new covenant, the further you realize, I knew nothing up until this moment. The more you realize it's greater and grander and bigger than we can even fathom. I, maybe once humanity gets to Revelation 21, maybe then they'll begin to fathom what the big picture looks like. But right now, we only see in um, small increments of what it looks like to live in the total glory of God. Yeah? It's a beautiful thing. Blow the trumpets, clang the cymbals, sing, praise God. Live in this place whether you are done or not. Whether you're new to this journey or not. Whether you made mistakes yesterday or not. It doesn't matter. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Worship at the temple. Yeah. Amen? Yes. But many of the priests and Levites, the heads of the father's houses, old men who had seen the first temple wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this temple was laid before their eyes. Yet many shouted aloud with joy. He goes on to say that the weeping and crying was so loud, but the joy for excitement for those who hadn't seen the first temple was so loud that it was just that this noise was heard from all over the region and they couldn't tell which one was which. They just knew there was a lot of something going on. Yeah? Now, I've considered that the old men wept when they laid the new foundation because they were so in love with the things of old and they didn't want to move on to the things of new. Certainly considered that. But it doesn't say that. No history says that. But that's a safe assumption. I've also considered and leaned more towards and liked the idea that there was a group of elders, of Levites, of worshipers, who had lived long enough in captivity to remember what it was like when there was a temple and they wept bitterly for all the time they had without the temple. They wept bitterly because they just, they knew inside this, this groaning of the whole generation of people had been sacrificed without the thing that keeps them going, the temple of God. Yeah? Now, again, it's an inferior temple, but it's all they had. And if it's an inferior and they're weeping because they get this new one or they're shouting for joy for the idea that this new one would come and restore balance back to their people, if that's their excitement for it in an inferior temple, where is ours for the superior one? Where is ours for the one that um, we get to steward and we get to praise and we get to have offerings for? Amen? Amen. Here we go. This is actually what the Lord wanted to share today. This is for somebody. A couple people distracted out there, but I... This is where you tune in. If all my jibber-jabbering doesn't, doesn't get you going, this is the part that God told me to share today. Amen? Yeah. Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the descendants of, that, of the captivity were building the temple of the Lord God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and the heads of the fathers of the house, and they said to them, this is the adversaries of Judah, this is the surrounding tribes of them, let us build with you, for we seek your God as you do. They're coming to Jesus, y'all. And we have sacrificed to him since the days of Ashrod, king of Assyria, who brought us here. The people around them said, let us come build the temple. We're with you guys. We know your God too. We know him just like you. And we've been sacrificing to him. And we now want to help you build the place where he will be. They go on to say, the, the, the leaders of this, um, of these Levites, this tribe, they say, you may do nothing with us to build a house for our God, but we alone will build uh, to the Lord God of Israel. Then the people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah. They troubled them in building and they hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose. This is uh, when I read Ezra uh, back Monday. This is what the Lord jumped in my heart, and he said, this is what they need to hear. There's a lot of people getting excited 
about the hope of glory. There's a lot of people getting excited about a new temple. There's a lot of people who have had the hope of glory, who have had a temple in their heart, and they're getting excited about this new, greater measure, this marching towards this promise of God. And I assure you that the wolves never stop circling. You don't have to let them in. The world around you will tell you, yeah, I know Jesus too. Yeah, I know him too. Yeah, I've been sacrificing that dude too. I went to church one time. Let me tell you what happened to me. There's, this, there's always these circling influences around the temple in your heart. Always. It never stops. The media, social media will help you. The, every, the co-workers will help you. They're all, when you, you, you think I'm, you think I'm making that up. Maybe you never showed up to work excited about Jesus. See if the wolves don't hound, hone in on you. See if they don't circle and start. They want to take that hope right out of you because it reminds them that they don't have it. And the surrounding tribes around these, around Judah saw this moment and they came. And if you read it, read it. You can infer the tone. It's obvious. Hey, we know him too. We've been sacrificing. Let us join in the build. No. Now, God's got a plan. God spoke to us. God has Levites who he set on this earth to do one thing. Serve him and build temples. Serve him and build temples. Amen? Yeah. Come on. One thing. That's their job. The world around them is supposed to be influenced by the one thing. But the world around them is constantly trying to dictate how the temple gets built, run, uh, organized, decorated, sacrificed. The world around is constantly trying to drive it and look where it got them. Yeah? And if, just in case they regretted that decision, they immediately turned against them to make it hard, to make it frustrating, it says. They, they even hired people to work yeah. against this yeah. purpose that they just said, yeah, I'll be a part of that. That's what happens to the wolves around you, whether they know they're wolves or not. And really, you all know my deal. What's a wolf today is supposed to be a sheep tomorrow. I don't give up on people. But don't let them build a temple. Yeah? Your job is to let you and God and Levites, if you got some in your life, build a temple that changes the wolves into sheep. Yes, Lord. Amen? I know it can get a little confusing because just like these surrounding tribes of Judah... Hey, we know God. We know him too. We sacrifice God. That can get a little confusing because there's an awful lot of ideas going around on how to live this life under the flag of we know Jesus. That's why I read so much of the Bible to you when I preach. So it's no guessing game. Or at least encourage you to go read it for yourself, one or the other. Yeah? Jesus made it abundantly clear with this one little thing that's in most of the gospel accounts. He's teaching to a group of people, and his brothers and his mother came. Now, if you know anything about Jesus, you know he was quite fond of his uh, biological mother. Seemed to be fond of some of his brothers. The woman who he loved, the last thing on earth that he attended to before he gave up the ghost and uh, went on to drink new in the kingdom, as we talk about, his mother. When that woman and his brother shows up, the crowd says, um, his brother's brothers came, the crowd says, hey, Boss, uh, your mom and your brothers are out there. They need to talk to you. And he says, who is my mother? Who is my brothers? Like, just so we're abundantly clear, guys, it's not who you think it is always. Now, in this case, Jesus' mother, she was good with you know the whole kingdom thing, so she's in the crowd. <laughs> but he's making a clear point here. It's yeah. not always who you think. He follows it up so we're not left guessing. He slipped around the room, the audience that was listening, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. But whoever does the will of God is my brother, my sister, and my mother. Not heard it one time in church. Not, I had a checkbook and a pair of khakis, so they made me a deacon, and let me tell you what they did wrong. Let me, now you think you know, I know, I've been a deacon before. Well, what does that mean? I mean, nothing. I mean, not in the church what we've been living in for the last 200 years. Yeah? Hearing the word of God is not doing the word of God. The word of God says we were meant to be loved, 
mercy, kind, patient, forbearing, enduring with long suffering the things around us, the purpose of God, following a king, a sacrificial king who was who was the greatest servant of all. That's doing the will of God. That's the brothers and sisters around us. Now, I'm not saying that we create a haves and have nots. That's not what we're here to do. We're here to transform the world in the name and the power and the blood of Jesus. We're here to change the landscape around us. But we will not get there letting the surrounding tribes build the temple. It will not be a successful temple. Yeah? I'll tell you how important this was. As you go on and read the rest of Ezra, I'm, uh, I'm going to skip a bunch of stuff. Skip to this, keep to this one topic. After they finish building it, after the people start to return, they realize one um, very important detail has gotten askew. The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands with respect to the abominations of, it goes on to name, Hittites, Canaanites. Uh, uh, I left a lot of names out because I can't say them all right. <laughs> yeah? The leaders of the people said, mm, sorry, you can't help us build it. We have a word from the Lord. The Levites have to oversee it, and the Levites will do the work. Yeah? But the people, and some of the less leadery people, the ones who had more things, other things on their mind, it said, for they have taken some of the daughters as wives for themselves and for their sons, and the holy seed is mixed with the peoples of those lambs. Now, this is an awkward topic to cover in the modern day world because uh, we believe in the covenant of marriage and that um, it is get married, stay married, work it out. That's the deal under this thing with Jesus. Grace of God to make it happen is there, I promise you. But in this story, remember, it's symbolic of building the temple in your heart. Yeah. They had to all go divorce those wives and put them all out. They had children by them. It was a devastating moment in human history they had done wrong and they had mixed with the thing they were supposed to save and then they had to go do it undo their wrong and i will encourage you in this the only thing more awkward than not being caught up in the world is trying to publicly undo what you have done mm -hmm. trying to unmix the, the get the leaven out of the lump jesus said little leaven leavens the whole lump and nobody's getting it out once it's done. See, it's this thing where we, and if, and if it's, and if you've already made some of these mistakes, there's a redemptive power in Jesus. We'll talk about that in a second. But um, it's this picture of he has this thing inside of us, this grace through this word of God to just be what he says to be, to be in love with what he said to be, to, to follow his voice unashamedly and to tell the world around us, because we're not always trying to win them over, right? We're just trying to live by a great example that they see and think, wow, that's what I want to be. See, nobody won me over for Jesus per se. I just saw something that I had never seen before, and I thought, yeah, I want that. That looks like a much better plan than what I've been on. Mm -hmm. Yeah? We don't have to, you don't have to meet people where they're at always, because that's a horrible plan. <laughs> that's what got these people in trouble. Yeah? They, 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 let the, they let the surrounding world influence. They tried to influence the temple, although they seemed to get that right. But then the, all the people who were supposed to serve in it were, were, were intermarriage and mixed the holy seed with the lost world. Now, this is, um, this is a very important uh, other symbolic concept that we see in this, in this sold-out, zealous for Jesus Christian life. If you put on the full armor of God that they write about in Ephesians, I assure you, the great, treacherous, demonic war that comes against your soul and all that, it kind of starts to not have much effect on you. That's just, that's just God's honest truth. If you're really wearing every piece like Paul said you could, the warfare on you goes way, way down. But the people around you get still getting hammered. And the ones you love are the ones who will hammer you back. It's a weird thing. Guard yourselves. Guard your hearts. Guard the temple in you. Don't let the world build it. 
Don't let the people who are supposed to be coming in and out of that temple make sure they're not getting mixed up with the world around them. Yeah? This temple of God that was built, um, especially the original one, the first temple was so full of the Holy Spirit that once a year the high priest would go in um, to make a, a, a one big sacrifice for all the sins. And it was such a thick Holy Spirit presence that they would tie um, dried pomegranates on him like, like bells. Um, and so that when he would walk, his robe would shake and the bells would, would, would jangle jangle. And they'd tie a rope around his foot. In case he wasn't completely right with God that day, he'd fall over dead and they'd drag him out because nobody else was qualified to even go get his dead body out. Yeah, that's where we were at when we started this thing. Before Jesus comes back, they've done so much intermingling, intermixing. They've fallen so deep into legalism, and they've made the word of God a weapon against the people instead of a liberation for yeah. the people that the, that the temple doesn't even have the Holy Spirit in it anymore. That's just a historical fact. Because Pompeii sacked Jerusalem before Jesus ever came. It's not like a Jesus changed everything and the Holy Spirit left. He wasn't there. Pompeii came before Jesus was even born. And he conquered Jerusalem. He said, I've got to see the place that's so full of a God that it kills people. And him and his men went in and checked it out. Nothing happened. Year after year, that old dead religious system was still putting the pomegranate bells on like it was going to kill somebody. But he wasn't even there. Convincing people to stick to the system, feed the system. Come on, guys, do the system. But there was no liberation for the people. See, when Jesus came and he actually released the new covenant, and all of a sudden the, the commandments could be written on your tablets of flesh, your heart, and this river of life could flow out of the heart, out of this altar, now we're liberated. Yeah. We're liberated to the point that life or death makes no difference. We're living in eternity. We're liberated from the point that our past sins no longer define us. We're no longer um, judged, heaven or hell, by our past. We're judged by right here, right now. Are we living with Jesus? Are we stewarding a temple? Are we letting the world build it or not? Yeah? 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 If you have let the world participate in your temple build, go ahead and just, just destroy it. Yeah. By the way, it was those very peoples who would destroy the temple every time. Every chance they could. Go ahead and let God just bulldoze it, start over. He'll build it back quick if your heart is pure, if your intentions are pure, if, you're, if your motive is to be the living, walking temple of God, to be the vessel of the Lord that he said you were made to be. If you wanted to be the brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers who, who were the ones who do the will of God. Amen? Amen? There's nothing more awkward than having to undo but there's nothing more motivating than thinking that you would have to undo it one day. Yeah? So lean into what influences have I allowed in my heart? I'm not going to say that's not a tricky thing this day and age. I'm not going to say that there aren't some pretty flashy pastors out there that have humongous followings that make this church look like I'm as unsuccessful as, as, as you could ever be in the church world that aren't telling you to do things that had to have come from the surrounding tribes. The name Jesus doesn't always mean what we think it means. It's those who do the will of God. These people said they knew the name too. Amen? So I just wanted to encourage you. Go back and read Ezra if you want. I skipped over all the hard names to read. You have to read those for yourself. <laughs> And go back and start to read and think about First Temple too. First Temple is very fun to read with the idea that it's symbolism for a temple being built in your heart. Second Temple. Second Temple is a better example of recovering from failure. First Temple is more like I'm coming to Jesus for the first time, and it's oh, there's just they're gonna basically admit the first one was amazing. I didn't I didn't plan on cover that day but the first one was so exciting they they this one they built an altar and did some sacrifices right they kept the ordinance the first one they killed everything 
like I forget the numbers, but it's like hundreds of thousands of sheep and oxen, bulls. And just, if they could get their hands on it, they killed it for God. They, they, um, they all, if you notice, they have ASAP with the symbols and they have certain ones with the trumpets and they all have this thing that they're made to do. When the first one, when the Holy Spirit started coming, it says they abandoned their, I forget the terminology, but they abandoned their order and they all just went into worshiping the Lord. I can feel the Holy Spirit just talking about it. Right? Yeah. They abandoned the thing that they thought they were only made to do perfect. And they just all went into freestyle worship. And the Holy Spirit flooded the temple to the degree that it would kill a priest if he wasn't ready to be in that place. It was magical. And that's kind of like that first, like, that's that free coming to Jesus moment that most of us have had. Or if you haven't, I want to talk to you after church at lunch. But um, second temple symbolism is far more for, I had this first temple moment in my life. Now I just don't feel the same. It's just not, I just, I don't not, I still believe, just don't feel it the same. I just, just don't connect the same. I just want to be. Well, that's why there's lots of historical accounts of human failure in the Old Testament. The consequences that therefore come, guess what? I can just sum it up every single time. They depart from God's perfect plan, bondage, some form of enslavement. For either 400 years or 100 years or this or that. It's different forms of bondage, different forms of slavery, different time periods. But it's always brutal. The, the reason why those forms of bondage are usually long is because it's often the people who cho knowingly walked away from the ideas of God that allowed the bondage to creep in have to die off, usually. When you're reading symbolically, you get into... Maybe the friends that helped you get from first temple to second temple era of your walk, maybe they need to die out of your life. Maybe the only way you'll be the thing you want to be, which is a great influence to them, is that you do not let them build the temple and hope that one day they can see it in full function. Amen? Yeah. Just a word of encouragement today. <laughs> so Jesus... We just thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the Old Testament, Lord Jesus. We thank yeah. you, Lord, that we get to learn yeah. from their mistakes so that we don't have to live them. Yeah. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that, that like you died on a cross physically, naturally, literally, you died on a cross and told us to follow you, that we must also take up a cross, that we get to take ours up spiritually, symbolically, figuratively. We thank you, Lord, that we get to live in an era where we don't slave away building blocks and mortar, that we get to just be the, the temple with the tablets of flesh. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that the... I know that this word was from you, Lord. So I know that for anyone who's feeling like they've let some influences build a temple, I know you're going to give them the grace to eradicate that leaven from their loaf. To eradicate that influence from the, the beautiful and so specific temple that you told us to build. The details were just limitless almost on, on just even the just the what little they recorded. It just seems like everything mattered. Everything. It seemed like there wasn't anything that fell in the up to you category, that you cared about every little detail of that temple, and you care about the details of ours, Lord God. We come before you today, Lord, and we ask you, Jesus, save us from ourselves. Save us from the, uh, for we've allowed the influences. Save us, Lord. Let us see where sections of the temple, what sections that need to be undone and redone by you, by your word, Lord Jesus. By the people that you put on this earth with one thing in mind, to serve the temples. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for this day. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the grace you've released. Yeah. Jesus, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. You know, I don't do this often, but I do feel like if people have, if they feel like they have things they want undone in their temple, then now's a good time to stand up and just give it to God. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for those who feel like they have let the world's influence creep into their temple. 
We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you're just faithful to take it away. Lord Jesus, you said you would, if we were faithful to partake in a death with you, that you'd be faithful to partake in a resurrection with us. We just speak resurrection life over us right now. We speak the faithfulness of, of turning the temple back into your hands, into your model, your, your plans, your blueprint, that you'd be faithful to partake in the, res the restoration of our temples right now, Lord Jesus. Jesus, we just thank you for your kindness and your mercy. We thank you that you're so tender with us, Lord. That even though we have this magical book to, as a map of life, we still fall into the same situations and circumstances. Lord, forgive us. Give us the grace to move forward in this new restored temple era. Give us the grace to lean into this 500-year increment where you're restoring the new balance, the old balance made new. What it looked like for everyone on earth to actually love each other, live life together, to break bread and live with a wild joy and a singular focus. We thank you, Lord Jesus. In your name, Lord, today we pray, we gather, we take up offering in your name, we eat this food in your name. We thank you, Lord Jesus.